Hello, I'm Simon and welcome back to the Bookster podcast from inside the SaaS holiday rental software company Bookster, based in Edinburgh, Scotland. Follow along as Bookster discuss their journey and their inner workings. Thank you for joining us and we hope that you find these conversations insightful and ultimately helpful. Now, I'm joined today, as always, by CEO and co-founder of Bookster, Robin Morris. Robin, how are you this morning? I'm very well, Simon. How is yourself? Good. Very well, thank you. Thanks for your time again today. No problem. I struggled through the rain this morning and made it into <laughs> the office. <laughs> it's a classic Scottish summer day. Yeah. It was It was Guy Dree. <laughs> uh, yeah, you wouldn't think it's the, the middle of June, but there we go. <laughs> um, and obviously a big day today with the, the football starting tonight, Robin, so you'll be glued to that, I'm sure, as well. Absolutely, yeah. So now we've uh, pegged this in time, this podcast recording. That's true. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good, yeah. that's good, that's good, that's good. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm excited and nervous <laughs> and... <laughs> well, d- dare we ask for a prediction then, for since we're talking about it, a prediction for tonight's match? Well, if the Germans can beat Brazil 7-1, I don't know what they could do to Scotland. But um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I'll be, <laughs> uh, I'll be optimistic. I think 1-1. 1-1, right, okay. Yeah. Well, at some point later on in the series, we'll come back to this and we'll see if you were right or not. <laughs> um so, right, 1-1, one, one. let's move on. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, sort of the history again of, of Bookster and how you've got to be where you are. We have touched on this, I think, in earlier episodes, but it's good to maybe explore it a little bit further uh, and, and talk about the process and, and your thinking behind it, doing everything. Um, obviously, we know from previous episodes that uh, you started as a sort of uh, maybe a more general company uh, doing sort of more general things for clients um so perhaps just for listeners who maybe have forgotten perhaps a quick overview of what you did do before bookster became bookster if you wouldn't mind yeah so we formed our company um kind of off the back of another company being sold but when we formed it in 2007 bookster didn't exist so it wasn't a thing we formed it, and essentially at that point, we had some software that was a content management system for the web that we'd written, so for sort of directories of things, um, you know, listing things and searching uh, things on a website, um, whether that was uh, su- suppliers of, of products or campsites and caravan parks or properties, holiday properties, or... Um, lists of members of a you know, membership organizations, it, kind of very broad, but a um, content management system that had all sorts of functionality, allowed people to log in and update their content, etc. Um, so we had clients um, in the events industry. We had, uh, had uh, we also. We also had something that allowed people to book things. I suppose that's relatively important. So we had clients in the events industry, clients in the uh, you know, theatre industry. We had clients uh, in publishing. So publishers used our content management system. Uh, we had clients, what else? Uh, we had clients in uh, MotoGP, uh, racing. Uh, who, who else we had? Um, all sorts, basically. Uh, and essentially we were we made most of our money really through contracts with clients to do work mainly and it was sort of hourly work so they would pay us to uh, manipulate or update our platform or make changes to the website and you know we would quote for work and uh, charge for it that was mostly how we were making our money right? at that time. And I guess that's probably the way a lot of web companies start, perhaps, in, in doing that and getting a foot in the door. Yeah, so I think most uh, web 
agencies, you might call them. So people who build websites for people, um, that's how they operate. They might build WordPress websites, say, and they charge a one-off fee or um, hourly fees for building the website. Uh, they may be involved in hosting them and they can charge a little bit for that, but they're uh, essentially mostly charging for their hourly work. Um, uh, or they might be, yeah, we were sort of contractors to some extent. You know, we were building new bits of software for people based on their specifications to some extent. They said, this is how we want it to work and we would, you know, we'd have an input obviously, but mainly it was kind of very heavily led by the client in terms of what they wanted. So yes, that there are lots and lots of people in that uh, state where they, yeah, that's what they do as their business mm -hmm. model. They charge people for their uh, services basically in that way, whether it's web agency or software developers, um, or contracting software developers, etc. Yeah, so we were that's really what we were doing. And I mean, how long did you do that for then? Um, so we did that just doing that really for a couple of years. Well, actually, I mean, uh, it wasn't like we stopped doing it immediately, it was a kind of phase out. So, um, yeah, Bookster. Um, came about as an idea in at the end of 2008, roughly. And our idea for that was, um, and I think we did this because, you know, like lots of other people, we wanted to be able to build something that um, we could sell as a software product, really as a software service. Um, and yeah, we had this idea of a book now button for your holiday rental website. You could pay us a monthly fee and uh, set your property up and allow you to take direct bookings on your website. That was the point of it. Um, and it would be yeah, software as a service. Um, and so we started out uh, with no clients <laughs> and slowly but surely we had one or two clients, but um, still vast majority of our business was um, paid piecemeal or hourly work. Um, so yeah, we were really continuing to do that for a good seven, eight years, definitely. I mean, we still mm -hmm. do some work like that, but mm -hmm. um, it's not where we make most of our money. Right. So I'm, I'm interested, I mean, we'll talk about, um, you know, this further, I'm going to go back a step, but just I'm interested, you mentioned a few podcasts before this, it's just about this idea of having this book now button. Um, I mean, it sounds like when you say it, it's kind of a revolutionary idea that changes the course of the company and everything. I mean, uh, book now button is not an original idea, I'm guessing, but it obviously was important enough to change your way of working. So this is a very... Uh, it's very difficult to put yourself in that position in 2007, but virtually nobody took instant direct bookings for holiday rentals in 2007. Oh, right, okay. it, it was very, very rare. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, so um, this is, yeah, people will forget what state things were in, I suppose, in different uh, times, but... Um, yeah, based, if you bear in mind, I don't know when Airbnb was formed, but Airbnb, I don't know, 2000, well, I have no idea, 2012 maybe, something like that. Um, and, the, you know, websites like um, holidaylettings.co.uk or HomeAway or any of these businesses, they were all sending inquiries. So you would, basically, you would send an inquiry to your holiday letting uh, person, right. owner or company, and they would come back and, you know, most of the exchange would be done over email. Um, taking direct bookings, allowing someone to put their card in and book a holiday rental, 
was actually very, very rare. Some of the larger companies might be doing it, but certainly as an individual property owner, it was very difficult. Um, so in terms of uh, being early and seeing that, we were very early, actually. Right, okay. um, so we were definitely ahead of the curve, I suppose. And um, I mean, it was obviously what was going to happen, but there weren't that many other people, you know, doing that. Um, so and that, sorry. I, I was going to say, certainly with our sort of previous business, so the reason we had this capacity to take online booking was that um, in our previous business with Caravan Sightfinder, which was, uh, which we had, well, I was involved with from 2002, I believe it was, or 2001 to 2007. And we, laterally, we were trying to get online booking up and running. And it was, you know, to, to get holiday parks or caravan parks to do that mm. was really, really tough. Um, well, that's so, yes. what I was going to ask. Yeah, I mean, how easy was it then to get clients to either stick with you or change their approach to this new idea that you've approached them with? I mean, I think everyone could see... So although we were ahead of the curve, probably in terms of presenting them with something that they could use, um, I think a lot of people knew that that's what they should be doing or that ultimately it will be like that. It's kind of a little bit like where electric cars are now or maybe where a couple of years ago. Everyone sort of knows that yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they really... They, they'll kind of stick in their own ways taking emails and whatever and they'll come up with their own so it was hard is the answer to that question but um, uh, the, the usual objections uh, were around um, vetting guests really the first one is that was right. the first objection it's like oh well I I actually you know my holiday home is special and I don't just let anyone stay in it. So I have to vet people mm. and some people I don't let in. So, I, 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 and it's usually, you know, around uh, stag do's or end parties and things like that is what we're looking to avoid. Um, so yeah, vetting. The second one is around double booking. So they don't want, um, you know, they, they basically, it's logging in and making sure your availability is up to date so you don't get a double booking. That's the main problem. But I would say the number one objection was a, was around um, uh, yeah, was around vetting of guests. Right. But you uh, clearly, obviously, you know, got people interested and you're now living the dream, as they say. <laughs> yeah. So I, I suppose, um, yeah, slowly we, we got people um we got enough interest we were kind of subsidizing it really to a large extent it, it it existed as a one of the things we were doing so we could yeah we could slowly improve it over time uh add add some features and functionality so we could broaden its appeal to more people more holiday rental owners um and allow them to uh, I mean there's all sorts of features and functions that we added but and maybe got a bit better at uh, marketing it as well I suppose getting it out there um, up until um, I think it was 2019 we didn't actually have any marketing or sales or anything on it in fact yeah, until 2020, we had no sa zero sales. So no salesperson, no right. sales point, no one whose job it was to sell it or try and right. sell it. So, so there was, was no, no Johnny. There was no Johnny. Johnny no did not Johnny. exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've met Johnny already, so people know who Johnny is, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll have Johnny And he does the music for this. And he does the music for this podcast, exactly, yeah. And available for uh, all sorts of musical jobs, I'm sure. You want to hire them <laughs> for sure. something. <laughs> um, 
So you've you've now gone from being a, a sort of general com company doing generalised, I guess, uh, web activity to a company that has a specific product, which is uh, the bookstore, I guess. Um, and you've got you've got some did, in that process. Did you when you went back to clients with the the product, for example, did you lose some clients because of that, or did you did you manage to keep hold of the clients that you had, and just did they adapt to your new way of working? Yeah, so I suppose because we didn't have uh, fund, so we weren't funded. We were all organically funded or whatever, bootstrapped, whatever you call it. Um, this process took quite a long time, and so we did naturally shed some of the clients that we had that were doing that were using our more general products so as we built up bookster in that niche as it were we did you know some contracts came to an end naturally there were some and it, and, it, and it took a lot it was kind of evolved over time so we were um yeah i suppose if this is something you are looking to do in your company um if you're listening to this um we did it over a long period of time and so that's might not be how you want to do it you might want to get to the end state quicker but we did it over a long uh, time now there were some clients that we effectively fired <laughs> okay. we told them to go and look elsewhere for services we gave them notice and said we don't think that you're a good fit for where we're going and we don't think we can provide you with a great service into the future. And one, there was one particular client that was quite large that we did pretty much told to leave because it was too much of a distraction from Bookster and they were taking us in directions that we, you know, didn't want to go and I suppose that's that actually if you are wanting to get to where to have a product and to have you know a software service more quickly you need to you do need to be able to say no to people quite a lot um, yeah I mean hearing that it, it, that must have been quite a, a moment for for you and for bookster i guess to have to, to actually get rid of a, a big client like that it must be a bit of a scary moment yes yeah yeah it was and um it is still quite difficult to say no to people who are offering you money to do certain things to take either to take bookster in a certain direction or add certain functionality it's unless it's something that we already wanted to do or we can really see how it would really benefit bookster it's you kind of have to say no to people and that's what's quite tricky when you've made that decision to right okay we're going to try and take the company in a direction where we ultimately have this product that we're going to try and make stand on its own feet mm. you can't spend time building software that's just totally for one particular client even though they're paying you and it might seem like they're paying you a reasonable amount of money for it because it distracts you from building the product but it also creates a bunch of software you have to maintain and look after uh, into the future which sucks up resources so yeah that's it is quite difficult mm. um, so your, your product now then is it's very much bookster led rather than client led i mean you you tell them in a sense, what you're doing and they either yeah. get on board or not, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's... <laughs> so, it's obviously the, the right way to say this, if you're a client listening to this podcast. <laughs> it's not that we don't listen to clients and make books are better for our clients based on their feedback. That is uh, is definitely a big part of trying to make it better is mm -hmm. people will tell you when you're making when it's really wrong or they might come up with really great ideas but that's quite different from a client leading a specific 
um, development for a function for paying you specifically to do something it is quite I mean not it's like never say never if someone said oh here's lots and lots and lots of money <laughs> <laughs> will you build it to do this then it's going to be difficult to say no to that you might say yes and say right okay we'll take that hit because right. it allows us to do all sorts of things but you have to be if it's just a case of them paying your normal hourly rate or something or not paying you that much you it's yeah being able to say look essentially if we're doing this work over here what we're not doing is something over there mm -hmm. thing over there benefits all of our users this over here only benefits a couple of our users they are paying us for it but so how do you say no to them in a nice way or say look we might get around to that later but we just can't do it so yeah it's that you're right it's it's um from having projects that are client-led to having a product that is client responsive maybe rather than client led but i mean i think that and for anyone listening who are your clients i guess and potential clients um i think that from an outsider's point of view sounds like you're a company that will then focus on the product rather than you, you want to make the product the best it can be rather than just doing things for you know a bit of money here and there you're actually bookster is always going to be the best product that you can come up with because you're you're focused on what you want to do rather than being distracted like you say by other clients saying oh can we just add this in can we just add this in and it becomes something that it's not your vision i guess so, so it's it's nice to hear or good to hear that bookster is quite focused on on what you're doing yeah absolutely i hope people think that um and the sort of two things that feed into that as well is that uh people our clients it's important that they buy into what we're our sort of philosophy generally. So you come up with a general philosophy, and we talked about this in the first few podcasts. But uh, they have to buy into what you're doing, and perhaps they might have to shift a bit of how they're operating in order for it to work for them. But mm -hmm. if they buy into it, that's great. Um, but yeah, the other thing is that. At when we're building anything and this actually goes back to right at the start as well is that you're you're not going to make software that everybody likes and i think accepting that at the start of whatever software product you're doing is quite important that you you're not going to build stuff for everyone and even the biggest software companies in the world um, you know, say Apple or Google or Microsoft you always speak to people who are like I hate Apple or I hate Google or I really never use Microsoft stuff now they're massive they've got massive broad user bases but you're always going to rub someone up the wrong way with the way that you do something because you're doing it your way um, and even though those the software you know apple google microsoft whatever they have mass appeal so they're they're doing things that or the types of products that they're building have the potential to appeal to lots of people um which we're not really we're building something that's relatively niche but even within that niche we have to accept that there's some people that we're going to probably run up the run up the wrong way because of the way that we work um and it's not it's not that they don't like us personally. It's just the way we've written our software, they won't like it um, because they prefer something that looks a bit different or has operates in a different way or works on their device better or you know whatever that may be. And but as long as we, as you say, we're building something that we think works for a whole bunch of people, works for the people that think that work that that uh, in our niche um, then we can slowly get our own client base user base and and expand from there and you know they'll tell their friends we'll you know 
we just slowly organically uh, build ourselves up. That's the that's the plan basically, and that's how. Yeah, I would say if you're starting out and you don't have a product and you're thinking about building one, one of the things to think about is not not everyone is going to like what the way that you do you work. So don't try to make it mm-hmm. appeal to everybody, and don't be offended when someone says, "Oh, I don't." I'm not actually a big fan of your software. It doesn't really. I don't really like how it works. Sure. Hey, you, have, you have to yeah. listen, but you also have to <laughs> accept that that's a possibility. Yeah, but you're not going to please everybody all the time in anything you do. So I think that's a good yeah. lesson to put out there. Um, yeah. I guess we're just conscious of time. Maybe one last question for this podcast, uh, Robin, is you talked about your process of going from you know generally uh, general to sort of specific um if you were to do it all again would you have started with a specific project to start product to start with or or would you have you enjoyed the process of where you've gone and, and where you are now or, or or would you do it differently um it would be nice to have had a product that worked more quickly that we could get a user base more quickly. I think we've been quite slow (laughs) in getting a user base up and running. And it's perhaps because we had lots of these other things, so we we weren't forced to get a user base going. And so I think if we were to do it all again, yeah, might force ourselves to... uh, go down the product road a little bit quicker mm-hmm. and okay. try and yeah maybe I'll, maybe be a little bit more so when you are taking on these bigger projects also make sure that you're you've also got something set aside to continue to build your product that you really want I don't think I would go down the and this is maybe a conversation for another podcast don't think I would go down the raising money from investors and literally it being the only thing we're doing and if it doesn't work it's going to explode and disappear don't think I would go down that road but that was ma- that would mainly be because investors would have a very they'd be your boss basically and mm-hmm. that's you know, it's nice not to have that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of transitioning yeah might have done it a bit quicker okay but i guess you know the route you've taken is has got you to where you are now and you're providing you know a good product for a good amount a good amount of people so um so no i guess everything has its pros and cons but no it's just interesting to hear uh, your thoughts and for anyone listening you know should they go into a market with a product or should they spend some time developing other things as well i suppose it's it's different for everyone i guess at the end of the day yeah right well look it's almost 30 minutes of this podcast so we've 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 chatted for a while today so thank you for that it's been interesting to hear about the process a bit more involved than than we've done in the past so that's a, a good episode there i think um if anyone had any questions on what they've heard today or any of the other previous podcasts do remember you can send them in to uh, podcast at hooksterhq.com um, that's podcast at hooksterhq.com uh, we've also got our sister podcast which is smashing your holiday rental goals uh, that's uh, hosted by kelly who was on our podcast uh, or is going to be on our podcast depending on which order you listen to these podcasts in <laughs> But you will, uh, you'll hear her or will have heard her. Uh, anyway, so I'd recommend going to listen to that podcast as well and leave a favourable review on that one, please. And also this podcast, if you can, as well. Um, Robin, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. And uh, we shall meet again soon and see if your predictions for the football was correct or not. Uh, <laughs> What's your but- prediction? My prediction. Uh, okay. Uh, well, my prediction then. I'll say it's probably going to be 2 1 to Germany. 
Oh, man. I'm afraid. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway one of us will be right or whatever uh, right okay in that case thank you again uh, thank you for listening and we'll see or speak to you all very soon and take care until then bye bye bye